Hi, it's Mike again with Uptastic. I'm sitting down at Go to Chicago with Eric Meyer. Eric Meyer is well. If you've worked with Microsoft Technologies over the last decade, you've worked with something that that Eric has, has created or, or been a part of, uh, from C Sharp to the uh, Azure Cloud Platform. Uh, now you're 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 away from Microsoft and you're working a lot more in the the open source uh, world. Um, well, first off, thank you for sitting down with me. But can you tell me a little bit about uh, what this 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 platform that you just spoke about, this reactive framework? What is that, and and what what is that? <laughs> okay. So so yeah. So I, I can um, try to explain that in in um, in general terms because that I think is also where the kind of, you know you mentioned open source mm -hmm. where the kind of the, the the value of open source comes in. So the, the thing is like if you if you want if you're trying to compose a software, um, in my view there are uh, four different kind of effects mm -hmm. that as a developer you have that you have to take into account. Right. So let's look at the the simple you know when you're doing when you're programming Java and you're calling a method. Right. Typically the method returns one value. And that method is executed synchronously. So you call, you know, um, two string, and you know th that call blocks and then returns a single string. Right. Right. So that's kind of the, the simplest synchronous um, call that returns one value. So input, wait, output. output. Yes. yes. Now the second thing that what you do is that if you make a call, synchronous call, mm -hmm. and what you get back is a collection of values, mm -hmm. like uh, iterable in, in Java. Right. So you make a call and now you get back an iterable, but that iterable represents multiple values, but also they are synchronous because you, you call next, next, mm -hmm. next, and each call to next is blocking. Right. Okay. But the, 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 the important thing is that there's two, you know, ways to compose your program, one where you have a single result and one where you have multiple results and then you know when you have multiple results you loop over that and, and so on. But those are for for synchronous programs, those are the two kind of main um, ways to compose your program. Now let's go to the asynchronous case because that's the very important now that we're moving to more kind of you know distributed world. When you make a call you don't want to be blocked because there's like latency, errors, whatever, you know, we all know the kind of fallacies of distributed computing. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do is you want, you want to make these calls asynchronous. Right. Now and there's a lot of uh, talk these days in JavaScript and many languages about how to deal with asynchronous calls. And in my opinion, when you have an asynchronous call that returns a single value, mm -hmm. um, what you do is you return some kind of future or you know, promise or whatever, how you want to call it. Right. And in .NET, that is, they use the, the type task for that. So a task represents a computation th that is asynchronous that has a single result. Right. So you make a call, you get back this thing that represents you know, a promise that you know, there will be a value at some point. Mm -hmm. Um, now, what Rx is, is that it complements this picture by having what happens if you have a, something that returns multiple results asynchronously. So, say you make um, the, the, the most natural example is maybe Twitter. Mm -hmm. You make a call, you, you send a query to Twitter, and what you get back is a stream of all the tweets. Right. And you're not asking, give me the next tweet. No, Twitter will kind of you know, notify you when the Just next tweet. Just pulls up a buffer. Of well, it just notifies you with events or something, or like your, uh, and even on your local machine, if you're doing um, event processing, like your mouse moves, mm -hmm. or so on, you're not asking the mouse, give me the next mouse move. Right. You get notified, so you get a sequence of, of collections. Sorry. Probably shouldn't drink uh, <laughs> <laughs> soda. It's okay. Uh, it's okay. Um, now, so 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 what Rx is is it's it's trying to kind of you know deal with asynchronous computations with streams of data, asynchronous data streams. Okay. And 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 if you look at languages like Erlang, they have embraced that that same paradigm for a long time, right? Where you do message passing, you have two different agents that send messages to each other, um, and and so what this is trying to do is to define an interface that you can put on on different services, and then you can glue these things together using this interface. Okay. Uh, a lot of the examples you gave were in, in .NET. 
Is this a Danet only thing? Ah, that's a very good question. So one of the um, things is that since this is an, uh, an abstract interface in the sense of abstract, that's a conceptually abstract, there's no language dependency. So okay. we, we, uh, we um, on the open source side, it's like, you know, rx.codeplex.com, okay. where we open source this. We have versions for JavaScript, for .NET, and for C++. The C++ one is not as mature. Right. Um, then Netflix has written a Java implementation. Um, GitHub has written an Objective-C implementation. Mm -hmm. And in Dart, uh, Google has the Dart Streams library, which is also um, based on these principles. Okay. And then other people have done like Python and and Ruby, and so there's like, uh, again, this idea of having asynchronous data streams is not tied at all to a single language, and that's exactly also what I want, because you don't know if you're on, on the server side use Java, and I on the client side use JavaScript, and I still want to kind of exchange, you know, events with you. Right. So um, that's, I think, very important that that it's not tied to a particular language. Okay, so it's a little bit more like a protocol? It's a little bit more like a, like, like, like a protocol. Okay. Um, because the, the, the what we call the Rx grammar or the Rx design guidelines. So if, if you and I are exchanging messages, mm -hmm. um, what the protocol says is like, what is the, you know, how are the messages represented? What is the binary format? Or what is the kind of, you know, what is the state machine that we use? So Rx has a very simple state machine like that. So I can send you a number of messages that are ordered and then I can terminate that stream successfully. That means you don't get any more, or I can say something went wrong, and then, right. you know. So that's really the, 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 the protocol okay. um, that, that there is. But it, it, it makes certain kind of assumptions. Um, right. So, but what, what is, you know, I, I'm, I'm not so sure if, if it's really relevant to make a distinction between a protocol and an API, because you can also say, if you have an API for files, Right, you have to. You open your file, you write and you read, and you close the file. That's kind of a protocol too. So, right. for me, I, I'm. Yeah, it, I don't. It, it's somewhere in, in between. It's a well. I, I think I, I like to emphasize what what is the same instead of what's different. Um, so there are certain ways that you should use or expectations of in what order you make calls, um, and whether you want to call that a protocol or not. I mean, that I'm fine with either way. Well, is, is it kind of like if, if you start to use the word protocol, it becomes kind of rust and it becomes dogmatic. And yes. Then, then people, because protocol is very formal, and it's like everybody has to do it exactly this way, and if you don't do it this way, you're not you're not reactive. Yes. So, that's okay. the next thing you're yes. saying. This isn't restful. This isn't reactive. Yes, and, and, and so I'm trying to be very um, easygoing with that because, for example, you know, if you have an existing service, um, for example, I, I, I'm... And, um, in the past weeks, I've implemented a wrapper for Logly, which is a is, is an, um, a logging service. So what you can do is you can send it values, events. You know, mm -hmm. what, they're just like byte streams, and then you can query them later. So it's like now what what I did is I wrapped that in a reactive you know shell. Right. Um, so the underlying thing doesn't know anything about Rx. Um, yeah, it's just whatever you know the REST API that that the Logly guys um, exposed. But now you know by my making your client library you know talk RX. Now there's no difference between you know um, Logly or your mouse. And so now you can kind of you know mesh together you know things that come from Logly with your mouse or and you can visualize it. So. It allows you to compose. So by by making exposing all these things with the same interface, then you can compose them. But you you don't force the interface kind of you know all the way down. So that's right. kind of you know. So you can always it's like bridging the protocols, right? You can always you know. And one of the things I think about that's interesting for as a is more of a. I, I I'm a business developer. I'm the one yeah. that implement just an implementer. Um, is thinking about the log not as just a place where things go to die, <laughs> but that the log is, is something that, that's alive and can feed back into the application and, and provide information for back into the app, not just, oh, this is a thing that I go to figure out when something went wrong. Yeah, so, so, so this is, it's kind of interesting. If you, if you look at, and, and again, you have to be very careful that you don't abstract too much because then everything looks the same. 
But if, if, if you look at a UI, for example, right? What is a UI? Well, I'm sending things into the UI, mm -hmm. and maybe to change the back color of a button or to kind of, you know, make a button um, you know, disabled. Mm -hmm. And out of the UI come a stream of events like mouse clicks and mouse moves and, and button clicks. And then my my code, my UI code, transforms that stream of, of UI events into other events that it sends into the UI. Right. So there's this loop where there's the UI and then my kind of event processing and they are kind of coupled in a loop. Now, if you look at something like Logly, for example, there's no difference there because my program sends events to Logly and then can query those events and then go back. So you, you get the kind of same loop. Mm -hmm. So, and suddenly a lot of these things now look very similar. Right. Um, because you're observing you know, like it's like you, when you write UI code, it's like you're observing the UI, and based on what you see, mm -hmm. you're kind of doing something with the UI. So, you know, what is a logging system? You're observing your running code, right. and based on what happens, you can kind of, you know, uh, do you something with it. To that. Yes, and, and like when you say well, yes. logging, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and when you say logging, you know, that goes there to die, yeah. then why do you do it? You do the logging to observe the behavior of your code such right. that you can, you know, uh, intercept when something you know, unexpected happens, or um, yeah, and what in a way it's thinking about what my relationship is to the application, and then starting to abstract what I do, where where I s I run my app, and then I watch the logger, and I'm watching messages fly by, and then I'm like, oh, that wasn't right. Then I go do something. Well, okay, now I can start to abstract that thing that I did, and, and realize that that stream is data. Yep, and I am. It, the observer watching yep. that data, and then I'm gonna react, and and I think that's just a way to kind of um, realize what's going on with the reactive. Framework. Yes, that's 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 how I just processed it now. Yes, <laughs> and, and that, that's exactly right. And then what, what I'm trying to do is that you can automate yourself away. Yeah. So you write then now what what, what the next step I would say to you is that now write some code that will do what you what do. What I did. Yeah. And then uh, and then now you can kind of you know create more value for your business because now because once you can automate it right. really you know a human doesn't need to be there or one thing that I'm also trying to do is that there's many things where the data like with, with these logs for example this, I think this is a nice example there's so much data in the logs mm -hmm. but you what you have to do is you have to turn that into something actionable for humans mm -hmm. right and so I think that that's one of the things that I'm trying to make easy where you can take massive amounts of data and then you know use the computer to kind of you know munch that such that at some point you get something that's useful at the human scale right because we cannot deal with millions of events per second I mean even it, well, nobody can do that right, right? We, can, we can maybe deal with like you know one event or alert every five minutes right so what you want to do is that's kind of you know you want to boil down all that data into something that's consumable by humans and the rest should all be automated. Uh, to take a step back, we, we talked about how this is a this is a uh, not not to use word protocol, but this is a way that many different types of platforms and, uh, and mm -hmm. languages can interact with each other. Uh, so I'm presuming you have to share the this these concepts with many different audiences. Uh, you you a Microsoft audience who's who's implementing in .NET. Uh, a JavaScript audience who might be running Node um, or, or running browser-based applications um, or a Java. So I'm just wondering how you share this message. Do you, when you go and talk about Reactive Framework, do you, t do you use Microsoft examples of the JavaScript or do you tailor for, for what they do or for Java again? Tailor okay, for, so, so for this is an, a very good question. So what, what you always should do is that you should kind of, you know, phrase things in terms that are familiar to your target audience. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking with JavaScript people, you should use you know JavaScript um, examples. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that I really enjoy now being you know on my own mm -hmm. is that it, it's in some sense much easier to kind of you know go and 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 embed yourself in a different community. Mm -hmm. um, so and, and and we I already gave the example of, of Netflix that did Rx for Java. Right. Um, while the the underlying ideas are the same, it, there's very 
big differences actually in the Java and C sharp languages that then affect the the concrete design of the API. Um, for example, in .NET, there's this notion of extension methods where you right. can take any type and you can add, you know, um, they, they're not virtual, but you can add like instance methods to that type right. um, independent of, of the type itself. So for example, if you have array of int, I can add a new method like conceptually to array of int. In Java, you cannot do that. Um, Java 8 has, you know, virtual extension methods on interfaces that, that are slightly different. But so for example, the, the design of Rx for Java, you know, has to stay within the constraints of Java. So what, what I'm trying to do when I work with, with people that, that do an Rx implementation for their language is to make sure that it feels natural for their environment, right. but still embodies the same underlying, more abstract, I would say mathematical principles. Uh, let me give you another example. In JavaScript, mm -hmm. on array, there's already functions like map, filter, and so on. So when you do Rx, which is you know the, the, the push-based version right. of that, you're not going to call them select and select many. You call them map and where, mm -hmm. because you know that's you natural. The metaphors to that are natural. Exactly. So that, that's kind of what I'm. One of the things that I'm really looking forward to is to work with all these different language communities to make this thing kind of feel natural for what they're doing, and then still being able to interoperate between you know machines or between languages um, where the protocol is kind of you know consistent. Okay. But the implementations should feel natural. So uh, let me give you another example. When we did the JavaScript version in the beginning, in JavaScript the casing of identifiers is opposite of C sharp. So in C sharp it's like you know two strings starts with uppercase. I always forget whether it's Camel or Pascal case. Right. I always have to do wiki look up that up on Wikipedia. Yeah. Whereas in JavaScript it's it's different. Right. Right. So what we did in the beginning is we used the the .NET naming conventions and then all the JavaScript people would go like eh. and then I was like, oh man, that's bike shedding. But then I realized no I'm wrong because I find it annoying too if, if, if you have to go the other way. Exactly. So we, we changed that and now, you know, uh, then Jafar Hussein from Netflix said, oh, but we sh should change the names too. So my, my thinking has evolved very much that now it's like, okay, you do what's natural for the language and then, um, you know, make it still conceptually the same. And then you pass the kind of same test. So there's, there's a, a whole bunch, like, I don't know, like, 3,000 unit tests and that specify the semantics. So it's really maintaining the semantics across languages but with different implementations. Um, and I must say it's, it's th that is the hardest part is that some things don't um, translate. So you have to, well, which is also nice. Right. Like for example, what I mentioned with the extension method. So you cannot just take the C-sharp um, implementation and just plug it into a different language. So you, you have to really work hard on that to, to, to make it natural and to make it possible in a different language. Okay. If I'm if I have some pet language and I'm looking at oh, I'm very interested in this reactive stuff and I want to implement it in, in my pet let's just say Python. Let's imagine yep. Python doesn't yep. have anything. And where where would I go to learn about um, or or talk to people and, and understand what how to implement it what what the the underlying principles are okay so th 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 that's that's a very good question so there's um there's learnrx.com so th th that's uh, uh, one of the .NET early okay. uh, users that has written a book there's also paul Betts and jesse liberty have written a book a very thin book on on rx um, which I like because it's thin. <laughs> um, and then there's the Rx guidelines that give you a little bit more of the semantics. Okay. Um, and, and, and so I would say, you know, you start playing with the .NET version or the Java version, um, and then, you know, you, you, you go from there. The other thing is that in some sense, the JavaScript version that we have um, for .NET is a little bit like a reference implementation because JavaScript okay. doesn't have threading and, and so so in many cases the, the implementation there is simpler than the .NET version which is highly also highly optimized it's very mature code it's like you know so because it's it's written for you know for performance rather than clarity you know looking at that code may not help you that much 
Okay. Um, so, so, but the the common reference seems to be JavaScript. The, yeah. So JavaScript is probably the kind of thing that, that that's the most approachable. Okay. Um, and then the concepts are not that difficult. I mean, that, that's the things like. Well, I think you have to be careful that you know. I talk a lot about duality and category theory, which might you know scare people off. But it, this has nothing to do, you know, in some sense, with that. That's one way to explain it. Mm -hmm. Another way to to explain it is, say, you're a JavaScript programmer, mm -hmm. right? JavaScript already has a notion of events. Everything in JavaScript is event-based. Right. Now, one way to look at Rx is to say, well, but events in JavaScript are not something that are first class. So I cannot have an array of events, or I cannot have a function that returns an event. Right. right? It just it's a byproduct of the environment. Exactly. It's not and a thing. Yes, and what Rx gives you is it makes events into things that you can ma manipulate and, and pass around. Okay. So it's uh, one way to uh, that Rx is all sometimes also called is like first class events. So in that sense, you know, it's very familiar to JavaScript programmers because it, it takes these concepts that they already know mm -hmm. and another concept that they already know, like arrays. Arrays are first class things. I can have a function that takes an array, I can have a function that returns an array. And now you, you allow the same for events. Mm -hmm. And the power of that is that you can now decouple the source of the event, say a button that fires events, mm -hmm. from the events itself. So for example, I can now create an array that has the values and then make that into an event source, for example, to test. So I don't have to have a button that fires the events, but I just put the values in an array and say to event, and now yeah. that thing serves as an event source. Um, so that, that's the kind of trick. So it's really conceptually not that hard. Um, but then, of course, you know, the, the subtlety is once you make that first class, you have right. to kind of be careful uh, because of the asynchrony. Okay. Well, thank you very much for taking yes. the time to sit down with me. I really appreciate it. Yes, and uh, you know, I, I would say try it out. And uh, if you, you know, we, we're always uh, happy to accept uh, you know contributions. Uh, yeah, and you said it's on Codeplex. Right? It's on Codeplex and. Uh, and the, the Netflix version is on GitHub. Um, okay. That's uh, Java RX uh, on GitHub, the Netflix side. Okay, and Learn RX is is the place. Yes, to start. yes, and so I, 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 you know, you will probably put those uh, <laughs> yes. URLs up those there. links so. will be in there. Okay, perfect. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, that's my edit point. <laughs> <laughs>